President Trump's redefining of anti-Semitism, implications for freedom of speech in higher education. I'm Nader Hashemi, the director of the Center for Middle East Studies. I want to thank uh, specifically my colleagues, some of who are on the panel this afternoon, for suggesting that we explore and examine this topic. I realize there's a lot going on in the country at this moment. There's a lot going on in the world at this moment uh, where Donald Trump is implicated, and this might not be at the top of the national agenda or international agenda at this particular moment, but nonetheless, we believe it's an important topic. Our center, our school, takes issues of, um, of bias, discrimination, bigotry, uh, extremely seriously, and so anything that overlaps with that broad theme, specifically as it pertains to the Middle East, is of natural interest to us. Uh, in response to uh, the rise of pro-Palestinian activism on college campuses, some supporters of Israel have argued that harsh criticism of the Jewish state amounts to anti-Semitism, and, e and it even violates federal anti-discrimination laws. The Trump administration recently has reopened a seven-year-old case involving alleged anti-Semitism at Rutgers University, and it has officially embraced this new definition of anti-Semitism. The, the U.S. Department of Education has been instructed to understand and interpret what constitutes anti-Semitism today in the United States along the lines of this new definition. This topic obviously has huge implications for the struggle against racism, bigotry, discrimination. It has huge implications for questions of freedom of speech on campus, and it has, has huge implications for teaching the politics of the Israel-Palestine conflict in the classroom and beyond. And so we're here to examine this topic today. Um, um, the format will be as follows. Um, I'm gonna show a short four-minute PBS um, news item that provides some background and context to this particular story. I think it'll shape uh, the mood and the conversation, and it'll update you in the audience if you're not up to speed on exactly what's happening and why this issue is a matter of concern. Then I'll turn um, uh, the floor over to the panel. I've asked them each to make um, roughly about 10 minutes of introductory remarks, um, and then we will have a little bit of a discussion, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for questions comments and analysis. Um, on the panel today, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the people on the stage with me, is Andrea Stanton. She's an associate professor of Islamic studies and chair of the Department of Religious Studies here at DU. Her research focuses on media and religious identity and investigates the relationship between new technologies and claims to religious authority as well as state authority. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Jonathan Sharkin is next, um, sitting in the middle of the stage, Associate Professor of History and Judaic Studies and a faculty member in the Center of Judaic Studies here at DU. His work focuses on Jewish and Middle East history with a research emphasis on Jewish life in the late Ottoman period. And last, and certainly not least, is Adam Rovner, Associate Professor of English and Jewish Literature, as well as faculty member in the Center for Judaic Studies. His areas of specialization include modern Hebrew literature, American Jewish literature, um, Jewish nationalisms, uh, um, Holocaust literature, and narrative history. All three of them are um, um, affiliate faculty members of our Center for Middle East Studies. So with that as an introduction, we'll go to the video, then I'll turn it over to the panelists, and we'll get started. back. Now this controversy came out at the same time that the Trump administration adopted what may well be a new definition of anti-Semitism in schools, one which is being received both by cheers and jeers. Pro-Israeli groups herald the move that would change how the Department of Education investigates allegations of discrimination against Jewish students. Critics worry it will stifle free speech and criticism of Israel on campus. Here with the backstory and details of that aspect of the story is Politico's education reporter, Michael Stratford. Michael, welcome to you. Good to be with you. So let's set the stage for what the, the Civil Rights Office of the Department of Education is now doing. And they are referencing a case that, that arose at Rutgers back in 2011. Give us just a quick sense of what that was all about, if you would. 
Sure. So in brief, a, amid ongoing tensions there between pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian students, a pro-Palestinian group held an event at which it was alleged that some students were charged an admission fee that was different uh, based on a perception that they were Jewish or pro-Israel. Uh, that is a fact that's in dispute in the case. Several um, organizations filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights alleging that discrimination uh, under federal civil, civil rights law. The complaint was dismissed uh, by the Obama administration in 2014. The administration cited a lack of evidence. Several groups at the time appealed, and that appeal has been pending since 2014. What the Trump administration did last week or several weeks ago was to reopen the case. Um, and they did so, did so in sort of a controversial way because they, in doing so, adopted a new definition of how the office would uh, define anti-Semitism. But let's first talk about Kenneth Marcus, because some of the people who are critical of this action have been critical of him. Why? So Kenneth Marcus, for a long time, has advocated uh, for, for Jewish students on college campuses and has uh, sought to combat anti-Semitism on college campuses. The concern expressed from some civil rights groups and some uh, advocates of Palestinian rights is that some of his approaches would effectively stifle free speech on campus and stifle opposition to the policies of Israel on college campuses. So am I correct that essentially that what it seems to be saying now is that the notion of ethnicity is certainly something that the Office of Civil Rights will look hard at and that they are saying we are going to put the, the notion of a pro-Israeli uh, Jewish community into that category. So now they haven't had done a find, finding on this yet, correct? But they said we that gives us a basis to look into it rather than what the Obama administration has said. Is that a, a, an accurate depiction of the position? I think that's right. What the what the letter that went to Rutgers last month said was the Trump administration is reopening this investigation to examine the evidence that was was already there in light of this new definition of anti-Semitism, um, which includes in some cases delegitimizing Israel as anti-Semitism. Right. Well, I, I, Michael, it, it's a bit complicated. You helped us to understand it much better than we did before. And I, I think this is going to obviously continue, and our hope is we can get you back in here and talk a little bit more about this case as it moves down the line. Thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you for having me. You'd be welcome. Okay, with that as a, uh, an introduction, I haven't asked the panelists if they have a preference for who goes first. So if there's no objection, maybe we'll just start in the order that is uh, seated on the stage from my left and we'll just go forward unless someone strongly objects and we can negotiate the terms of the presentations. Andrew, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, <coughs> so, uh, great, thanks so much. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm starting at 12.13. If I'm still talking at 12.23, can one of you guys just steal my microphone? <coughs> um, okay, so since I'm now going first, um, <coughs> let me just talk really briefly about um, the kind of context here. Um, if you by chance read some of the backgrounders, including the letter that um, Kenneth Marcus sent, um, I think that you will find that many of the provisions of the working definition of anti-Semitism that is now being adopted are um, seem, I think, fairly standard. For example, anti-Semitism would include calling for, aiding, or justifying the killing or harming of Jews in the name of a radical ideology or an extremist view of religion. I'd call that anti-Semitism and dangerous. Um, <coughs> accusing Jews as a people of being responsible for real or imagined wrongdoing committed by a single Jewish person or a group or even for acts committed by non-Jews. That also seems pretty reasonable. Um, <coughs> in other words, most of the provisions I think are are ones that would fit within other kind of well-established definitions. I think much of what's um, animating the concern about uh, the kind of new approach under Kenneth Marcus is <coughs> the background on who he is, which I think this clip gave a, a kind of um, introduction to uh, concerns over the secretary of the Department of Education and her um, 
background in higher education and her preparation for her role. Um, <coughs> and so it's, it's kind of the contextualization. Um, and I think for me, um, not to be totally pedantic, but I like to do close readings of things. And so I went and checked not only the letter that was written by Marcus, which is the one referring to the Rutgers case, um, <coughs> but also the full text of the working definition on anti-Semitism, which is the one that was agreed upon in 2016 by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Um, and there's a part of that definition that isn't included um, in the letter from Kenneth Marcus. And I think um, there's, there's one particular part of it that's key because it, um, the IHRA is keen on making sure that there is not an elision between uh, Jewish people as people, Israelis as political citizens, and people who follow a Zionist policy as a political viewpoint. And so in the actual IHRA definition, um, <coughs> there is also a, a point in a paragraph that's not included in, in the Marcus letter that criticism of Israel, similar to that leveled against any other country, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. And so I think for me, that also makes more of a suggestion that perhaps there is something more going on in the current Office of Civil or Office for Civil Rights, excuse me, um, in the Department of Education. But if you actually read the entire definition, I think that um, <coughs> much of it accords with what um, I would certainly expect of standard um, provisions for being concerned about anti-Semitism. Um, <coughs> what I actually want to talk about um, in my remaining time is <coughs> where I think this might be going for a couple of uh, broader academic points. Um, and in the past month, as I'm sure several of you know, we've seen two cases emerge in which a faculty member at a US institution um, declined to write a recommendation letter for an undergraduate student because that student wanted to join a program in Israel. Um, <coughs> this, I'd say this has been in the wings for four years. Um, and we've seen it coming. Um, if, you, uh, if it's a surprise, I don't think it should be, and it's gonna be a bigger one. And so I think this is one to really highlight. Um, in 2014, um, one of the founding groups that was part of the BDS movement, which is the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, issued guidelines for an academic boycott. <coughs> um, and if you read them, they're quite clear that they specifically prohibit study abroad schemes in Israel for international students. Um, international faculty should not accept to write recommendations for students hoping to pursue studies in Israel. Um, and <coughs> um, they also prohibit international students enrolling in or international, te international faculty teaching or conducting research at degree or non-degree programs at an Israeli institution. Um, so I think it's not a surprise that this is coming up. It, as far as I can tell, it hasn't been addressed by the Department of Education, but I think in terms of considering the freedom of speech and at least the academic freedom aspect, this is something to, um <coughs> to pay attention to because I think it's gonna become more prominent. Um, and I think for me, it raises three key issues. Uh, the first one is that as far as I can tell, there are no guidelines um, in most disciplines and at most institutions in terms of how a faculty member decides whether to write a recommendation letter. Um, there are lots of suggestions in terms of what to include in a recommendation letter, but not suggestions about whether to write one. Um, <coughs> and I would say that I actually see this question come up in other areas um, on a regular basis in some online academic groups. And the questions are usually about whether to write for a student who's only taken one course with you or took a course five years ago, didn't do well in the course, asked <coughs> um, the day that the recommendation is due, if you're a student, pay attention to this, um <coughs> or, um, or they didn't even ask, they just sent the request online. Um, so the, the decision, um, <coughs> the, the question is not really about where they're going, it's about the relationship to the faculty member, and it's presumed that the decision whether to write or not is always on the individual faculty member. It's not an institutional decision, and it's not a disciplinary decision. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure that this is a question of free speech, but I think it, it could be an academic freedom issue, and I think that we are gonna see some new policies or efforts at policies and procedures around recommendations letters and job responsibilities. Um, in terms of the substantive issue, uh, whether to write a letter for a particular program, I think we're also gonna see that this has resonance far outside of Middle East studies. Um, I have Americanist friends, I actually saw one earlier, <coughs> um, who have noted that they would, whether they would or would not feel comfortable writing for a student um, going to join a program with a particular political affiliation. Um, and I've thought personally about whether to write recommendation letters for programs that seem predatory, that seem like really high cost, for example, um, <coughs> so I'm just highlighting that I think this issue is much bigger than the BDS question, which is behind a lot of the anti-Semitism arguments these days, um, and I think it's going to have some big traction. Um, and then finally, I think 
for me as an academic, the academic boycott platform um, also raises the issue of promoting or not promoting particular study abroad programs. Um, I personally don't send any study abroad notices to students because I don't want to give the impression that I'm endorsing one or um, another. Um, and I don't want to suggest that faculty are more powerful than we are. I send plenty of emails to students that students totally ignore. Um, so I'm well aware of the limits of my influence. <coughs> um, but I do, um, I do think that those of us on the faculty side and the administration side might take a broader and careful look at the emails we pass on, um, whether they're for study abroad, journal publications, events happening on campus or other things. Um, what are we endorsing with the emails that we send and what are we ignoring or minimizing um, with the emails that we don't send? Um, and so I think that these are some of the broader issues. I realize that the um, <coughs> the, the key framing has been around anti-Semitism, um, but I think that these are gonna be questions that are also key in terms of um, putting either putting back on Department of Ed or on institutions or on anxious board of trustees when it comes to broader questions of faculty responsibilities to students um, and the role of faculties and the potential influence of faculty members. Um, so on that really cheering and optimistic note, um, I will turn the floor over to Jonathan and then Adam. hear me? Yes. <coughs> All right, good. I probably don't need the microphone, but I'll use it anyway. Um, so I'm going to use my time to talk about the connections between the new definition of anti-Semitism um, and pen some, uh, I'll mention some pending federal legislation dealing with boycotts against Israel and return back to implications for higher education. I do want to point out, uh, I'm pretty sure that the language that we're talking about that the Trump administration adopted came from the 2010 State Department working definition of anti-Semitism under the Obama administration. Um, and the, this working definition of, of anti-Semitism um, added some language about ethnicity with regard to sort of um, defining who is and who is not a Jew, and also language about Israel. I'll note that I personally don't really have that much issue or, or any, and in, in some uh, my colleagues here may, with the language on ethnicity. And in, in fact, when I talk to students about um, you know how to define who or what a Jew is, I do point out that some Jews would identify themselves as not having you know any um, not you know believing in the Jewish religion, but may define themselves more broadly speaking as an ethnic or a cultural Jew. What I do have an issue with is linking that ethnicity to national origin and then claiming that you know that national origin being Israel. Um, you know, cannot be criticized um, in, in certain ways without sort of bringing about accusations of anti-Semitism. I think this is problematic from a First Amendment standpoint. I think it's doubly problematic because Israel doesn't even define what Israel is. Um, so that, that creates a bigger problem and I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, so first, let me just read, um, you know, what is anti-Semitism relative to Israel? This comes from the 2010 State Department uh, language. And I'll, I'll skip the demonize Israel aspect and I'll get to double standard for Israel, um, applying double standards by requiring a bit of behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation, multilateral organizations focusing on Israel only for peace or human rights investigations, and then under delegitimize Israel, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination and denying Israel the right to exist. Um, this is the main one, I'm not gonna get into um, great detail, but this is the main one that I'll be sort of focusing on with regard to my the, the comments I make in the rest of this, this talk. So how is this linked to legislation? Um, what I'd argue is that whether we're dealing with what the Department of Education is now doing from an executive branch um, position um, you know, with regard to this new language, or what's happening in Congress with Senate legislation, there is an attempt by two branches of the US government to curtail speech about both Israel and about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And I'll say flat out, I'm not an advocate of BDS. Um, but I, you know, I do not think that those who are advocating BDS should be criminalized, um, for, again, for various reasons. So the legislation, um, there's a lot of legislation at the state level. Uh, at the um, House level and the Senate level, there are two bills that are linked to one another, House Bill 1697 and Senate Bill uh, 720. House Bill 1697 has 292 co-sponsors and five of Colorado's um, seven congressional uh, reps actually back it. Only Jared Paulus and uh, Diana DeGette do not. 
Um, Senate Bill 720 has 57 co-sponsors, including both U.S. senators from Colorado, so bipartisan support. Um, Senate Bill 720 initially, when it came out in 2017, aimed to criminalize boycotts against Israel um, and was pretty vague in terms of who could be who you know who could be held criminally responsible. Um, it it appeared, and the ACLU wrote a letter about this, that anyone who was advocating for a boycott of Israel could be liable for up to for between two hundred fifty thousand and a million dollars in in penalties and up to fifteen years in prison. Um, Seven, uh, Senate Bill 720, the two co-sponsors, uh, Ben Cardin and Rob Portman of Maryland and Ohio, respectively, walk that back. Um, and so now you can only face possible financial penalties if you're a company that is at, if you're the head of a company or working in commerce advocating the boycott of Israel. Um, so you can pay penalties, but you don't have to go to jail. But one problematic aspect is that the new definition is more precise about where that boycott could be aimed at it, um, in order to be prosecuted. Um, and it, it says Israel and territories controlled by Israel. Um, so I, I just want to you know, put that out there. Territories and, and uh, Israel and territories controlled by Israel. Um, so how does this fit in to higher education? Um, what are some of the implications? Again, I, I link all of this together, um, you know, governmental attempts to suppress debate both in, you know, among companies and among the broader public and also higher education. I think a lot of this is also aimed generally at higher education because this is where much of the talk about BDS um, and critical discussion of Israel-Palestine happens. Um, I am really concerned about the, you know, I just talked about the congressional, um, you know, the congressional bills, but I am very concerned about the Department of Education's new definition of anti-Semitism um, linked to Israel, especially the last one I read, delegitimizing Israel. Um, so why, why am I concerned? In terms of students, um, this could be brand, used to brand student groups advocating boycott and divestment as anti-Semitic and could theoretically lead to federal investigations of these groups. Um, this itself is a big issue, but it becomes murkier because of the problems in defining Israeli self-determination. Israel lacks declared borders. Um, it exercises political sovereignty and military authority well outside of its 1949 borders. What happens if students or student groups advocate boycotts of settlements or argue that Israel does not have the right to rule over any areas outside of its 1949 borders? This has been the guiding principle behind U.S. diplomacy for the past 69 years, by the way, or for much of the past 69 years. Um, and I think it's worth noting that while the definition of anti-Semitism that has been adopted was from 2010, the issue is arguably even more relevant to politics today based on the current administration's views on Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem and the West Bank. And again, this is where I see the link between the congressional legislation, both in the Senate and the House, and also the new language on anti-Semitism. Um, the language in the House, you know, again, considers boycotts against Israel or targeted boycotts against Israel in the West Bank, against Israeli companies in the West Bank as against Israel itself. Um, and again, I, from an international legal standpoint, those two, those two issues are, are separated. Um, and again, when we're talking about deleg the delegitimization of Israel, um, since Israel doesn't have declared borders, what if the Israeli government says it is our right to have self-determination in the West Bank? To have it in Gaza, to have it in East Jerusalem, um, you know, is that covered? Does that mean that now whatever the Israeli government says is Israel um, criticizing that would be considered a form of anti-Semitism? This again, I, I'm repeating it a couple times because I, I want to make it clear. Um, this this is a key issue, and and finally, and I'm not sure where I am time-wise. I tried to actually keep this a bit brief. I'm always a little long in classes. Half this group knows. Three minutes. Okay, good. Um, so, so a personal issue for me as a teacher um, who deals with the history and contemporary reality of this topic in class is how, how I'll be allowed to teach it. And I teach most of the courses that deal with Israel-Palestine um, uh, on campus. I only deal with undergraduate students. I would say that 70 to 80% of my courses in some way touch on Israel-Palestine. Um, so this is basically my contribution to the university. This is, this is what I do. Um, and while, while I've certainly made political jokes in class, um, I do my best to avoid sharing political views related to specific Israeli and Palestinian policies. However, I do, my, I do my best to provide my own informed analytical opinion on topics when I believe it's called for. Um, after all, I'm a professor, not a referee. 
um, if I note my academic view that Israel has no international right to allow settlers to construct civilian settlements in the West Bank of East Jerusalem based on the Fourth Geneva Convention, will I be considered an anti-Semite under this new law? Um, or because I'm Jewish, maybe I'll just have to wait until the Department of Ed comes out with new language about defining who's a self-hating Jew. I have no clue. Um, <laughs> could, 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 <laughs> um, could the Department of Education theoretically bring a case against professors like me who don't even advocate for BDS, but rather just share academic opinions on hot button topics that wouldn't have been considered even close to anti-Semitic by experts in international law? And again, just, just repeating this one more time, um, this, this, uh, this language and also the legislation that I talked about, again, I view them as linked, um, they combine BDS and, uh, and boycotts of the settlements. So Peter Beinert, um, who's been to DU before, I was on a panel with him a few years ago, advocates for the targeted um, boycott of Jewish settlements in the West Bank. And he argues the Jews should do this. He does not advocate BDS, which is, um, you know, a, a lot of BDS groups advocate for a wholesale boycott against Israel in general. He's just advocating for it in the West Bank. Would someone like him be considered an anti-Semite for holding that position and sharing that position with students? Um, and so, again, these are just some of the issues. This is a roundtable. It's not a formal talk that I, that I wanted to bring up. Um, and I think one other issue that I could have talked about is sort of what I see as the driving forces behind this. Um, both within, uh, among some members of the uh, broader pro-Israel American, Jewish and American Christian communities in the US government. Uh, maybe we'll get around to that in discussion, maybe we won't, but I just knew I wouldn't have time to talk about that. Um, so now here's Adam. Give no. It, give it, yeah, yes. it takes a second, it's on. Great. Um, so like Jonathan, uh, I would like to concentrate on that one facet that I think is most problematic about the new definition of anti-Semitism regarding Israel. I'll just say it again for the sake of the pedagogical benefit of repetition. Denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination and denying Israel the right to exist has now been classified as anti-Semitism. Um, I would like to delegitimize the law in this law or this ruling in my time that I have here. It's not entirely clear to me why saying that Jews should not have the right to self-determination is anti-Semitism. I myself am Jewish and Israeli and a veteran of the IDF and do not support BDS. So I feel like I have fairly firm ground for saying that I'm not an anti-Semite. Um, I think that we can understand this right to self-determination, which is my understanding under international law, is an early 20th century concept and remains very murky in the area of international law as a big problem. Number two, I also do not see why it's an infringement of anyone's civil rights if we deny self-determination to a group. For example, if we deny self-determination to the Kurds, are we becoming anti-Kurdish? If we deny self-determination to the Tibetans, are we all of a sudden anti-Tibetan? I don't think so. I don't think we hate those people or want to persecute those people. I could see how this could be a very big problem in the future if corporate and individual government money starts funneling into a government that soon outlaws the uh, anti-Tibetan uh, notion or the Tibetan freedom movement. That could certainly happen. Or what about Turkish money that prevents us from discussing the Armenian genocide or Turkish autonomy? That to me seems one of the clear and direct problems with using this money uh, and this political pressure to support this. Now again, I said I wanna delegitimize this law. Um, I, I think it's actually pretty bizarre and unhealthy if you do oppose a state's right to exist, but I don't think it's necessarily anti-Semitic. For example, I myself am anti-theocratic. It doesn't mean I don't like people who live in theocracies. I'm sure there are very many nice Iranians and even very many nice Iranians in a government, as well as Saudis, possibly not those who dismembered someone recently, but many others. It doesn't make me anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim or anti those people. Um, so the question to me is where does this definition come from? And that's pretty interesting. The definition as we saw comes from Kenneth Marcus. And this is an interesting figure. Who is Kenneth Marcus? Well, he was appointed to direct the Office for Civil Rights under Betsy DeVos's Education Department. His Office of Civil Rights uh, aggressively enforces, that's his word, 
civil rights law, which prohibits the discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, or national origin. That to me is interesting because Judaism or Jewishness is not an ethnicity and not a race. I can talk about that more later, nor does it necessarily have a single origin. So their purview for what they can explore in terms of covering Jews doesn't actually fit with any definition of Judaism that is uh, appropriate, certainly. Previously, Kenneth Marcus had run a not-profit that was engaged in pressuring campuses to squelch anti-Israel uh, speech and activities. He was a vocal supporter of scaled back protections for transgender students, and he challenges affirmative action through amicus briefs filed uh, repeatedly. His appointment to this office of civil rights was opposed by more than 60 civil rights groups. So this may lead the question, why was he appointed to direct the Office of Civil Rights? This seems like a good question. Well, his, qu his appointment was championed, and the definition of anti-Semitism was championed by uh, one group notably, and that group is the Zionist Organization of America, which is directed by a guy named Morton Klein. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, who is Morton Klein, and who is the Zionist Organization of America, known as the ZOA? Once this was a fringe right-wing group, but now it is probably the Jewish establishment group with the closest ties to the Trump administration. It is a hard right Israeli group, and it presents its opinions to the inner circle of the Trump administration. Why do I say it's a hard right group? Well, in 2017, Steve Bannon was invited to be the keynote speaker at the ZOA gala. Also in attendance was Sebastian Gorka, the now disgraced ex-Trump aide and member of a far-right extremist organization in Hungary. Mort Klein, who runs the ZOA, has done this since 1994. They have a $40 million uh, assets that they control, and they get donations to the tune of $4 million a year. They are being sued by their former executive director for financial impropriety, including hiding donations and Klein's very large compensation package, which led to the revocation of the ZOA's tax-exempt status. Last month, after there was a terrible terrorist attack on Israeli civilians, Klein, Klein tweeted the following. There is no occupation in Judea and Samaria. That is what we commonly call the West Bank. Uh, where is your condemnation of the evil murders by your filthy Arab Islamist despicable brethren? The Nazis would be proud of the evil actions of murderous Arabs. Apparently, the new definition of anti-Semitism, it's okay to deny the occupation of land by Israel under international law, and it's okay to compare Arabs to Nazis. You just can't do, you can't uh, compare Jews. So now we know a little bit about the ZOA, but where does all their money come from? Well, that's actually very easy to find out. It comes from casino mogul Sheldon Adelson, who is the single biggest backer of the ZOA. He owns the Sands and the Venetian in Las Vegas, and casinos in Singapore and Macau. Um, Adelson also funds the right-wing free daily newspaper called Israel Hayom, Israel Today, which is a mouthpiece for the Netanyahu government in Israel. And he funds and owns the Las Vegas Review Journal newspaper, which has the distinction of being the only major newspaper in America to support and endorse Trump. Adelson is worth upwards of 33 billion dollars. He is the 15th richest person in the world. In 2012, he spent 92 million dollars supporting Mitt Romney and Republican candidates. In 2016, he donated 25 million dollars to the Trump campaign, their largest single donation, and he gave an additional 40 million dollars to Republican House and Senate candidates. He was a very uh, strong critic of Obama's policy on Iran, and he's a major supporter through funding and political back channels and through the media of Netanyahu. What else does he support? It gets better. He is a, well, for some of us, he is an anti-cannabis legislation supporter. His son died of a coke heroin overdose, uh, so apparently he's not a very good father. He opposes internet gambling. He opposes labor unions, and he only became a mega donor to the RNC after organized labor in Vegas began picketing his casinos and criticizing his employment practices. Adelson is on record as believing that the Palestinians are, quote, an invented people. In the last 10 years, he's given $150 million to Birthright Israel, which is a group that funds free trips for Jews in America of college age to go to Israel. Uh, at his behest, they have stopped meeting with Arab Israelis on birthright. 
All of this is perfectly legal. It's sleazy, but it's legal. But in 2013, his company did admit to breaking federal regulatory rules by bribing Chinese officials to get the Macau Casino approved and built. He is also dogged by repeated claims that he has uh, prostitution working out of his casino in Macau uh, in a semi-legal operation. Adelson, with the acquiescence of American Jewish establishment organizations and sometimes their willing financial and material support, has shifted the American Jewish organizations and its supporting donor class more and more to the right. This despite the fact that the rank and file American Jews vote by and large overwhelmingly about 85% for liberal causes. Adelson also funds and supports the CUFI, CUFI, the Christians United for Israel, which is an evangelical Christian Zionist group, which also has their own birthright program. I think that what we are actually witnessing due to uh, mostly the money of Adelson, but a few organizations who are willing to play ball with Adelson, as well as the administrations and the, Repu the Republican uh, organization itself, an evangelicalization of American Jewry that is directly supported by its donor class that has led directly in very three close points to the adoption of this law through financial backing. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we actually didn't, well at least I didn't coordinate the presentations in terms of identifying different aspects of this debate, but what was so great about the presentations, I don't know if you guys coordinated, but you actually did successfully uh, take on different components of this debate that I think cover the broad spectrum of what really is at issue here. And, and I wanted to thank specifically Adam for what you just said, because I think the politics surrounding this particular issue is incredibly important. You've just summarized what's happening. I mean, there obviously is this Trumpian moment that um, hard right supporters of Israel are trying to take advantage of to sort of advance an ideological agenda, like, like in other areas of, 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 of American politics today. So I think that's clearly what's happening here. We can talk about that in the Q&A if anyone wants to, to raise it. But I think at, at really um, at the core of this issue, what's I think relevant for us is really um, to maybe revisit some issues that have, debated, have been debated and discussed for very, uh, a very long time. Because, but because we're in a university setting, I think one of the sort of underlying core ethical concerns here uh, revolves around this old debate that's still, I think, worth revisiting, and that uh, would be the following. Um, where does legitimate criticism of Israel begin? Where does it end? And where does it cross over? Where does it begin to cross over into the area of anti-Semitism? I think that's an important uh, underlying concern that um, we should discuss. I have my own personal... Um, um, guidelines in terms of um, thinking through this issue, um, but I want to pose the question to the panel. How would you respond in your own sort of moral and ethical framework when it comes to this particular topic? Where are the red lines, in other words, where criticism goes beyond legitimate cri criticism of the policies of a government, of a state, and then it becomes, you know, in the area of what would clearly be, you know, bigoted or, or anti-Semitic in this case? Um, Andrew, do you want to start? We'll, we'll go down the Am I on now? Yeah, okay. there's a little pause, <coughs> yes, by the way. Will you right. turn on and off your microphone? I should take more there's pauses in life. <laughs> Two-second pause. Um, okay, so um, I actually think, so I teach a lot on extremism, um, and it strikes me using um, uh, Islam as a kind of corollary example that people who are on ends of the on extreme ends of the spectrum tend to adopt very similar positions. So people who are highly Islamophobic and people who tend to be Sunni extremists have very similar ideas about Islam and what Islam is. <coughs> um, this is not going to seem like it's connected, but <coughs> um, I actually think that when it comes to criticism of Israel as a state, like a state among other states, um, that there has been confusion, and I do see it in Arabic as well as um, in, in the Arabic language as well as in the U.S. between the use of the words <coughs> Jewish and Israeli as if they are commensurate, um, and the use of the word Jewish and Zionist as if they are commensurate. <coughs> and I don't mean to be um, just minutely focused on language, but I do think that language choice matters, and I think it has produced confusion probably since the 1950s, um, <coughs> which is at least as far back as I see it, um, that Jews and Israeli are the same, um, and that 
Israeli, Zionist, and Jewish are somehow the same, and therefore I think that builds up on both sides, people who actually are anti-Semitic as well as anti-Israeli, and those who are deeply afraid that all anti-Israel stances are also anti-Semitic stances, um, <coughs> that th there's a profound conflation. And so I don't think that we solve problems by simply making better language choices, but I actually do think that part of the challenge of, um, <coughs> of uh, the production of fear around criticism of Israel as a state and state government actions is also, you know, two generations at least of confusion between um, the the language about state identity and political identity and the language about religious identity. Um, and so I think that's that's where I would see before we actually draw a line. I think we need to see kind of at least one reason as to why this confusion is happening and one reason why there's fear behind. <coughs> um, if criticizing Israel is also taken as criticism of Jews. Jonathan? Did I wait long enough? Okay, good. <laughs> so I, I would I would echo s some of the, the, the comments that Andrea made. I, I do think that you see this, um, she was talking about with, within the broader Islamic world. I mean, I, I think in general, when you get to the extreme left and the extreme right ends of the spectrum, you often see a, a lot of convergence. Um, I, I struggle with, answering this question, um, providing a specific answer, and I, I guess I go back to um, the, I, I don't know if it was real or the apocryphal, you know, uh, comment that a Supreme Court justice made about pornography, that you know it when you see it. I, I don't, um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that we could ever come up with a totally precise definition. Uh, for me, I think it's very important to separate um, sort of Jews and Jewish history um, and, and views of Jews, as Andrea was talking about, from Zionism. Zionism um, and Adam um, is, is an expert on this, could say much more than I could about the, the origins and the development of Zionism in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, Zionism is a political movement that came from a, a popped up in a, a specific time in the late 19th century in a specific place, Eastern and, and Central Europe, um, linked to the spread of ethnic nationalism and racialized anti-Semitism throughout Europe in, in that period. Um, and so for me, when someone is, is criticizing Israel as a state, as a state action, Israel's, uh, you know, Israel's actions towards Palestinians in 1948, 1949, in the occupied territories since 1967, um, that to me is, is obviously all legitimate. When people start criticizing Israel, as Andrea was talking about, as, as Jewish in a sense, um, and, and conflating these terms, and, and some of the, the first page of, of the um, definition of anti-Semitism, anti anti I think, does a good job with this, which I didn't read, talking about sort of conspiratorial, um, you know, conspiracy theories about Jews and about Israel and about Zionist control of the media. That, to me, is obviously anti-Semitic. So, again, I, I can't give you a precise answer, Nader, um, but I do think that it's always important, and I always talk about this in class when I teach Israel-Palestine, to separate Zionism from Judaism um, and also to separate... Israeli identity from broader, if you want to call it as such, global Jewish identities. And I would say Israeli identities as, as well. After all, Israel has 20% uh, of its population, which is not Jewish. Just before we go to Adam, just let me just push you a little bit. Um, what often emerges in the debate um, um, is, well, Israel calls itself the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. So it does then associate being uh, Jewish with Israel. And this sort of complicates and makes it much more difficult for us to, 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 to find where the proper parameters are. How do you, how do you make, navigate that? Yeah, um, <laughs> so yeah, I agree. The Israeli government does that. The Israeli government also denies um, certain actions that it's committed, in, in which case you know, could, people could be accused of sort of peddling conspiracy theories when in fact they're talking about the truth. Um, again, that's a governmental self-definition. I, I think, uh, I guess my, my pushback on this, and I don't know if it's, if it's perfect, Israel has half the world's Jewish population. If it had 90% or 10% of the world's Jewish population, I don't think that Israel can speak for all Jews. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, Israel can call itself the Jewish state. Um, that doesn't mean that every Israeli believes that. It doesn't mean that every Jewish person around the world has to agree with that. Um, and so even though Israel calls it that as such, um, I, I think that when you're talking about the state, um, we can talk about discrete political developments within the state and policies of the state as opposing to always tying it back to something that's inherent in Judaism based solely on what how the Israeli government is defining yeah. it. Okay, great. Adam? Yeah, I think any I think there are certain things that are indicative of 
anti-Semitism. I think that if you had a student, I have undergraduates and graduates who is, doesn't believe the Holocaust happened, that is likely to indicate a conspiratorial and anti-Semitic mindset, but it could also mean that they are just fundamentally ignorant and grew up in a home in which peddled these ideas, and they come to a university in order to be educated. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would be careful about even something as obviously troubling as that. Um, I think that when you take an individual as representative of a group, if you said all Jews are like this and therefore I don't like them or this quality of them, then you are trading in bigotry and that is prejudice and that is anti-Semitism and that's wrong. Uh, certainly there is no sense of a monolithic Jewish identity. There is no sense of a monolithic Jewish political ideology, um, whether we're talking about in dispersal in the US or, or in Israel. I think that those who would trade on that idea that there is a monolithic or certain essentialized characteristics of Jews would be guilty of shading towards anti-Semitism and that I would find troubling. But I have had m many students who sometimes just come from places where they don't know any better um, and they need to be educated. And that's kind of what we're here for. And if we can't speak openly about these things, then we can't educate them. And I think it's gonna just perpetuate benightedness. Um, one, one last series of questions, then we'll open it up to the audience. At the core of this debate is really the issue that you know, has been addressed, it was in the, the, the PBS clip, and that is attempts to delegitimize the state of Israel or to deny Israel its right to exist is moving in the direction, or some people say is a form of anti-Semitism. I mean, you've, uh, Adam, in your comments, uh, the comparison with, I think, uh, the Kurds and the Tibetans is, I think, a, a good way of thinking about this. Um, um, does anyone else in the panel want to get to sort of that particular aspect of the debate? Um, there are people, I think, who deny uh, Israel the right to exist or delegitimize it and are motivated by you know, bigotry. Um, but my own view is that not everyone who criticizes the state of Israel and denies its right to exist, particularly if you're a Palestinian, is motivated by you know, feelings of prejudice. Is there anything that we're missing in this particular debate? Because that seems to be at the core of this new definition of anti-Semitism that the Trump administration is presenting. And it's an argument that we shouldn't simply dismiss, I think, so lightly, just because it's coming from Trump. I mean, I think there's serious sort of ethical questions here that we need to think through. You, you want to start, uh, Andrea, and then we'll go down the, we'll go down the line sure. and then we'll open up to the audience. Turn my green light. <coughs> so I think uh, one, one point I'd bring to you is that uh, the United States as a country Good. is not particularly known for a consistent commitment to the concept of the right of national self-determination. So <coughs> um, if it's being applied solely for political purposes, sorry, I'm overwhelming the microphone. <coughs> um, so the, the United States doesn't have a consistent track record, as far as I know, in terms of suggesting that a national right to self-determination is something that, <coughs> as a country, we endorse. Um, and so I think, in that case, we need to look at what work is being done when certain groups are said to have a right to national self-determination and not. Um, for me, personally, as an academic, because I don't take either a religious or particularly moral view of states, um, I'm not, I don't find that any state has a right or not right to exist. <coughs> I'm happy to be an American, but I don't consider that we have a moral right to exist or a religious right to exist. And so again, I think for me, at least the consistent point is that um, a state is a state. It, in my perspective, it's not a moral entity. It's not given by God. Um, <coughs> and others may disagree with that position, but from, from my perspective, I don't, I don't see that it's an inherently hostile position. It's a it's a maybe a real politic position. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of going to echo some of the points again that, that Andrea made, and maybe because we've co-taught together, um, I also tend to take a pretty amoral view of, of the international state system. Um, so again, I don't know if this will specifically answer Nader's question about um, how to sort of deal with the current situation where people, you know, there are people who try to delegitimize the state of Israel. There are also people who criticize Israel and argue on that, that the binational state is the only workable option, and that um, not because they're anti-Semitic, but because they argue that Israel's settlement policies in Jerusalem and the West Bank since 1967 have made a two-state solution impossible. Um, so, I, so I think that that's something to, that also needs to be mentioned. It always needs to be mentioned um, that, that talking about sort of Israeli policies bringing us to this point is not anti-Semitic. I think that that's where a lot of academics are in, in the field of broadly uh, 
the broader field of Middle East um, history or Middle East studies and also in Israel studies in general. Um, and I would say that in terms of, of the state, Israel is a state not because Israel has the moral right to exist um, and, and God gave it to Israel in my secular, you know, analytical perspective. Um, there was, you know, there was a, a specific settlement policy in both Ottoman and Mandate Palestine. There was um, behind the scenes international negotiations and lobbying about this. Um, there was Resolution 181, Israel won a war. Um, they eventually reached armistice agreements and then, then were recognized fully by the U.S. and, and admitted to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is how Israel became a state. Um, and so today, yes, there are people who try to delegitimize I Israel. I personally, and again, this is not a political view, this is just my own analytical view, I see the only threat to Israel's existence coming from Israel um, and coming from its own government's policies in, in the West Bank um, in terms of sort of the, the demographic political future of Israel and what is and, and is not, um, what is and is not workable. Um, and so I, I'm not so concerned in terms of, again, I'm not emotionally connected, so maybe it's easy for me to say, but I'm not so concerned that BDS and other groups are, are challenging the, the international legitimacy or the legitimacy in the US or the strength of, of Israel. Okay, Adam? Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm troubled when people wanna say Israel has no right to exist. I think that's a weird and troubling position to take because they often don't take it about any other state. And that to me is indicative of some kind of inherent bias. But leaving that aside, I would say that my position on an eventual, hopeful, maybe one day settlement is that I support Palestinian sovereignty to some degree, I don't know, we can argue what that looks like, precisely because I'm a Zionist, uh, not because I'm anti or pro-Palestinian, but because I think that in terms of real politic, like Andrea invoked, that is um, a reasonable decision to take for these people. That's it. Okay. Let's, let's take some questions. I'd ask everyone to keep their questions as short and comments as short and precise as possible so we can get to as many of them. Um, Gina has a microphone uh, because this is being recorded. Uh, and so feel free if you want to, to identify yourself um, and then ask your question. Alan, at the front. I'm a Jew who visited nonviolent movements in the West Bank, um, one of whose representatives will be in my class next week, Samuel Wad, and I would be happy if, if anybody would like to come. It's a Friday at 2 in C Center 1150. And if you don't get that down, write to me. It's a little hard to talk about. I think everybody's remarks are very good. I want to make a large point about it. We now exist in a campaign which inflicts on babies coming to the United States the idea that they're a horde invading us with Middle Easterners and couples this with the demonization of George Soros. That is pure anti-Semitism and in Minnesota District 1, the Republican candidate runs advertisements with piles of money and Soros. So the wonderful comments of Adam about Mr. Adelson seem to be funding this very anti-Semitism. By the way, the government of Israel, Yair Netanyahu, the son of Benjamin Netanyahu, uses the image of Soros as a demon in an anti-Semitic way, in a pure, Nazi-like, anti-Semitic way. Now I want to say, well, I want to raise a question, and that's just this. If the nationalist Trump and his white allies throughout the South who are disenfranchising people go one step further, perhaps they will say that Martin Luther King, the man of the boycott, is anti-white or anti-American. I think that was said, actually. I don't think there was a single white official in Birmingham who would meet with the demon king. 
Would they say that Nelson Mandela and all the rest of us who boycotted South Africa are what? Anti, to be anti-apartheid is to be anti-nationalist. So I would just like to say, you know, the Israeli government made a big thing about how Palestinians are so violent. So I personally thought that when they had a boycott, which I support, being a Jew, they were being nonviolent, and they wanted to minimize killing, and they wanted to work a decent settlement that would not involve killing, and they were appealing to international allies. And most of the groups, like uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, which were involved more or less with this campaign, are Jewish. So one of the things about this is um, some of us are followers of the prophets and not the kings. And I think actually that the general attack here on BDS, I have plenty of criticism of BDS, but the generalized attack in American politics on BDS is violates the uh, professed thought that it would be good for Palestinians to pursue nonviolent action against Israel, betrays the heritage of the civil rights movement, and really ought to be looked at very, very carefully. So I offer that to the three of you to, you know, try and vote. Thanks. Thanks. Does anyone want to comment on that? It's more, it sounded more like a, an observation and a comment. It would be really good if we just maybe paused for a moment and took dissenting views. If anyone had any sort of strongly dissenting views to what has been presented here, either in the, the film clip or in the, the remarks, I think in the, in the name of free exchange of ideas and debate, it would be great if we could hear from them. Bruce, yeah. I've heard discussion is this a okay I've heard discussion about that somehow there's uh, a dampening of uh, intellectual discourse as a result of these definitions of of anti-semitism but I haven't heard either any examples or any I, I just I don't have the faintest idea why there would be any dampening of using what's a kind of a conventional definition of anti-semitism and of uh, what should I say of, of not treating Israel differently than one treats other countries in discussion, why that should be uh, seen as, as any kind of a problem for academic discourse. Okay, so yeah, so in what way, I guess, does this potentially new definition of anti-Semitism infringe on the right to have academic and intellectual discourse? I think, is that, is that the question? Yeah, I think that, that, I think focusing our discussion on that particular point would be, I think, of use uh, 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 to dic discuss at this moment. If anyone want, Adam, you want to go first? Um, I think that Andrea. Yes. Sorry, killed one microphone, working on the next. <coughs> um, so I actually think that part of this is wondering what might happen next, but I think if we look to a broader context, <coughs> what I see is that um, <coughs> higher education for those of us who are in it seems very normative, like very much part of a typical American experience. And I think that those of us who are within the realm of academia all the time forget that <coughs> roughly 30 to 33% per of the United States adult population has um, a tertiary sector degree, has a degree in higher education, um, <coughs> that this is still a minority experience, um, a highly elite experience in many cases for most people, and that over the past five to 10 years, um, higher education has been seen as an increasingly, or with as an increasingly hostile space and also with increased hostility um, from people who have more conservative Christian religious perspectives or more conservative political perspectives. And so <coughs> I myself would just argue for us taking a look not only at this really specific context of whether we're considering anti-Semitism and changing definitions and how that impacts higher education, but also how higher education itself is somewhat in play in terms of political debates right now and how we might think about um, these two as connected. So this is one case study, but we're also seeing, generally speaking, um, <coughs> concern that um, is higher education too liberal? Is it um, too, is it, um, 
are we as instructors indoctrinating our students to be un-American, unpatriotic? Um, I think we could probably add other elements to this. And so I think this is one, one case study, some of it's speculative, but some of it's following on to looking at national politi dis political discourse over the past decade. I, I, hey, Bruce. Um, let, me, let me give you a couple clear examples of why we should be concerned. So one of the elements that I think is actually not very controversial in this definition is the following. I'm going to read it verbatim. Drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis, presumably policies of the Nazis. That seems relatively uncontroversial and not something that I would be eager to do. However, let us say that I brought up or handed out a reading by Moshe Zimmerman, Professor uh, Emeritus from Hebrew University, in which he uses the term Judeo-Nazi in response to the settlers. What about if I gave out an editorial written by the great Israeli writer Yoram Kanyuk, in which he compares the treatment of a Palestinian who is trying to cross from the territories into Israel with a violin and was made to take the violin out of the case and fiddle uh, while being jeered and mocked by the soldiers. And Kanyuk compared that to the jeering and mockery suffered by Jews under the Nazis. What if I compared an actual Israeli policy, so without editorializing, like Zimmerman or Kanyuk, but an actual policy which was that at uh, a given point during the Second Intifada at the beginning, Palestinians were uh, taken as uh, once areas were reconquered, say in the West Bank, the, Israel, the IDF would go in, they'd take these Israelis, they'd separate the men from the women and children, and they wrote on their inner forearm using Sharpie markers, numbers to keep track of them. And this is an obvious echo of the dehumanizing, horrendous uh, policy of the Nazis uh, and how they treated Jews at some of their concentration and death camps. So those are three examples where if I were to bring them up, have them read, or simply invoked, would I be accused of drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis? All, by the way, from Israeli media sources. Would I be guilty of anti-Semitism? Could a student who is aggrieved launch a civil rights lawsuit against me and this university for having to read that information or hearing that information. According to the standards of this definition, my sense is yes. And I think that that is a very serious threat to free speech, broadly, and certainly to academic discourse uh, has, could have a chilling effect. And, those are, and that's a relatively uncontroversial element of that definition. Jonathan? Yeah, and I, I tried to address this a little. I mean, I know I did it pretty generally in, in my talk, talking about the issue, uh, or my time, talking a little bit about the issue of Israel's right to self-determination. So I do have a concern, and again, I know that this is this is general and this is this is speculative, and I have not seen this dampen intellectual discourse to this point. Um, but if you know, if we are talking about Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and I and you know, I I note that. You know, international organizations, many uh, many international organizations view this as illegal, that Israel does not have the right to self-determination in the West Bank or Judea, Samaria, um, depending on, on what you want to call it. Um, is that, you know, is that a form of anti-Semitism? Am I going too far? Another issue I do want to mention, um, and you see this on various sides. Um, there, obviously, labels have become much more popular in the past 10 to 15 years when studying these issues. People are, you know, derided as Nazis or anti-Semites. Um, or Islamophobic for making various comments. In some cases, it's clearly true in terms of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And in some cases, these are politically charged, um, you know, comments that are being thrown at people. Um, and to and and one of my concerns is also to what extent does this empower some of those groups? Um, because now the federal government is stepping in and changing the definition of anti-Semitism with regard to to Israel. Um, and and again, I think I can't. I don't mean to speak for Adam. Adam can can chime in on, the, on this as well, but both of us have really tried to talk specifically about Israel here, the, the changing definition linked to Israel. Yes. I, I would just, 
I would just add the one the one other problem area where I see this legislation infringing upon is um, listening to Palestinian narratives about their own history and their own views of the state of Israel, which un under this definition could then be blocked because it's considered to be undermining and delegitimizing the state of Israel. Uh, so I think that, that would be the sort of the other added sort of problematic area that would infringe on intellectual discussion just to, just to hear, listen honestly to Palestinian voices and their own hopes for the future. Understandably, it would be critical of the state of Israel. I also just want to add, this isn't really your question, but <coughs> one of the things that does concern me, and I'm not Jewish, um, <coughs> and maybe that also impacts the comments that I hear, but I still hear a lot of casual anti-Semitism. I still hear casually anti-Semitic comments, um, not from people within higher education. Um, some of what I wonder is <coughs> whether if, if the, the concerns are about what professors are saying in their classrooms, does that give a pass to the ways in which I think there are large pockets of American society that still um, <coughs> have broad stereotypes about people who are Jewish um, and make very broad statements about people who are Jewish that has nothing to do with Israel. It has to do with a lack of education. It has to do with, I don't know, rooted prejudice. Um, and so I, I actually do get a little concerned about that, that um, we not be focused entirely on higher education, but think about what a focus on higher education displaces. We have a question. Is it maybe here at the front? Hi. Um, so you talked about how the language is like uh, with um, Jewish versus Israeli versus Zionist, how that is important. And I guess, I mean, this is just a clarifying question because genuinely I'm confused on how um, how you guys and uh, how you define a Jewish person and how this administration is taking that stance to define a Jewish person because I heard, you know, that it is, it can be ethnic but not linked to national origin and then that also it can't be ethnic. So I'm just... Just to clarify that, because genuinely, I, I don't know. Jonathan. It's on now. I get very excited. I'm an only child, so I like to talk. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I have, I, I may end up having the broadest definition of, of Jewish um, up here. Um, I'm, I'm someone who thinks that if someone wants to self-identify as a Jew for any reason, then that person should be considered Jewish. Um, I'm not in the position to tell that person that that person is not Jewish. So for me, whether one considers it an ethnicity for uh, for various reasons, even if it's because there could be common diseases that, that Ashkenazi Jews can get, that could be a really bad reason to consider oneself ethnically Jewish, but some people do that, and, and I'm not going to tell them that, that, that they are not ethnically Jewish. Um, so for me, it can be cultural, it can be ethnic, it can be religion, and I think within those three, there are, are broad categories. Um, so, so again, I have a very broad definition of what it means to be Jewish, and I think a lot of it may, might be linked to sort of my own self-identity as an atheist Jew. I don't, I don't know, um, but um, I'll let you know colleagues jump in. But again, for me, it's it's a pretty broad, broad-based definition, and and certainly, um, yeah. Again, just going back to this idea that if someone wants to identify that way, that I, I'm not going to tell them not to. Adam, did you, or Andrew, did you want to add anything? <coughs> so just to your question about the, the formal definition, I think this may get to some of the points that Adam was making. So the Office for Civil Rights, which is directly housed with, um, within the Office of the Secretary for the Department of Education, says that they use um, the Title VI law, which is not the Area Studies Title VI. <coughs> um, and so they, um, they followed um, Title VI in terms of... Uh, um, enforcing federal civil civil rights laws, and so that includes discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, on the basis of sex, on the basis of disability, and on the basis of age. And so <coughs> within the race, color, or national origin element, um, the gloss is that that includes actual or perceived shared ancestry or ethnic characteristics, including membership in a religion that may be perceived to exhibit such characteristics, such as Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, and Sikh individuals. And so that's the division, this, um, <coughs> the definition that they're using, and it does put religious identity within the category of race, color, and national origin. Um, so it does already kind of have within it a built-in movement back and forth between religious and ethnic identities. Well, hello, Ms. Major. Um, I uh, do not see Judaism as one ethnicity. 
And I don't think that those people who are most knowledgeable about Judaism would say that. So for example, there are Jews from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. There are Jews from the Mediterranean region. There are Jews from Arab lands. Those all have different ethnicities, by which I mean cultures, language, food ways, uh, relationships of gender, uh, cultural codes. They're all very, very different. So I don't see how we could say that my ethnicity is the same as my friends from Yemen who are Jewish. That'd be very, very different. We do share a same religion, whether we practice or profess it or not, uh, and we do share a sense of some kind of national identity that is, uh, extends beyond a single border. And I think that the categories that we've tried to come up with, uh, race, ethnicity, in the West don't necessarily fit to the kinds of categories they have in the Near, near East or, or Further East, which I know nothing about. Um, what I mean by that is that Jewish understanding and self-understanding is, I believe, this is my sense of it, far more tribal than it is in terms of uh, a Western national or religious identity. And I think similar things could be argued about Islam as well. And I'm not using the term tribal, as somehow that's a lesser degree of uh, sophistication. Not at all, I'm, it's, a, it's a mode of description. So I, I believe that Judaism is a religious grouping that may or may not profess that has a transnational diasporic conception that is perceived and actual. Okay, I'm gonna try and wrap this up by 1.30. Let's take maybe maximum three more questions. One, two at the back, and then if there's one more at the front. Okay, so go ahead. You know, I see this redefinition of anti-Semitism as a way of uh, appealing to people's tribalism in, this, in the United States and for political, polit politicizing religion, uh, uh, politics, other things, other uh, issues among us. And it's le led to a lot of division among us. Uh, rather than bringing us together. So I wonder what you uh, think of that idea that um, religion is being used for political purposes. Go ahead. Um, some of this, I think, goes back to Adam's point um, at, at the very beginning and when he was defining sort of the ZOA and talking about Mort Klein and, and sort of the reasons behind this. Um, so I'll, I'll take this you know, more specifically to this issue of anti-Semitism and why some of this language may be coming up today. And again, uh, you know, I will link it back to what, I've, what I was talking about before with the congressional issues. I think that there are a couple issues here. I think that first, yes, there is a politicization of, of, of this issue um, of religion, but also, again, because we're here talking about the definition of anti-Semitism linked to higher education that invariably, inevitably comes back to Israel. Um, you know, the politicization of Israel um, and again, Adam talked about sort of the funding behind this, the, the political reasons, especially on the right behind this. The reason why I want to bring back the congressional issue um, is because it allows me to make a, a broader point about U.S. society when it comes to this. I think there's a lot of bipartisan support for this among older Americans, um, not necessarily among younger Americans. And I think we see this again with the fact that this language came out of the State Department in 2010 under the Obama administration um, and the congressional actions that I, that or the congressional bills that I talked about have a strong bipartisan support. I think on, on the Republican side, linked to groups like ZOA and KUFI, as, as Adam was pointing out, there is a political, you know, there's a political background here that there are strong groups within the conservative movement that are trying, that have been successful. I wouldn't even say are trying, they've been successful in shifting the Republican one way, I, Republican Party one way, and I think on the Democratic side, there's an understanding by key donors, uh, many of whom uh, are American Jewish donors linked to centrist or you know historically centrist um, groups like APAC um, that are part of the American Jewish establishment that see changes among younger Democrats and younger American Jews when it comes to perceptions of, of Israel and are trying to set a status quo that cannot be changed going forward when it comes to discussion of Israel. Um, so I think that there are different reasons on both sides of the political spectrum if you wanna take a binary sort of liberal conservative or Republican Democrat view of this. But I think for, for various reasons on both the Republican side and the Democratic side, anti-Semitism or, or the politicization of Israel is, is taking place. So, and, and again, I could always say more about that, but we're running out of time. 
Um, let's go to the, the second to last question. Go ahead. Um, I was curious to hear more about the law you're mentioning, Jonathan, um, the anti-boycott um, anti law, and it seemed like from the numbers of co-sponsors that could have a reasonable chance to pass. I'm curious if you think it is likely to pass, and if it does, what the legal response would be. Um, as someone who is a legal scholar myself, I feel like I could imagine so many different legal challenges on First Amendment, potentially under Religious Freedom Restoration Act for people who feel like they're doing the boycott for a religious reason, like I think a lot of people have mentioned, um, and maybe even a commerce argument, since it would, the court has ruled that Congress can't create commerce where it doesn't already exist. Um, and so yeah, I'm just curious it, if you think it will pass and if it does, what the response might be in the courts. I keep forgetting. I spent 12 years in postgraduate education, and I don't know how to use a microphone. Um, so, Sarah, you would be much more able to talk about some of the legal per repercussions. I mean, I have read the Foundation for Middle East Democracies legal analyst view, and also the ACLU's views. Um, both both groups think that this would be struck down if if it were to pass, and they link it to a state law in Kansas that that was somewhat similar. And again, I'm not a legal expert. I don't have a lot of time to sort of go, you know, to, to get into the minutia of, of these documents, but that is my understanding. Um, in terms of the broad support, it does, yeah, 57 co-sponsors in the Senate, um, and, and it should be noted, only one person has withdrawn co-sponsorship, and that's Kirsten um, Gillibrand in, is that how I pronounce her last name? In, um, in, in New York. Um, and so at one point, I guess it could have had 58, and obviously 292 is enough to pass it um, in the House. So I do think that if, that if it ends up on the president's desk, it could become law. My guess at that point, is that it would be struck down by the Supreme Court. But again, I'm not a legal scholar, so that's, that's my guess based on what I've read. That's the most I can say. Okay, last, uh, last question here at the front. So hopefully I'm loud enough that I don't need to worry about this, but oh, I'll thank you. It, use it, yeah. no, I'll use it, all right. Um, so we may not have time for this, but I wanted to take a little bit of a deeper dive um, into the self-description of Israel as a both Jewish and democratic state and what that means, not only for what we can say about it, but for the path of what solutions could be. Because I, I often make a point, and it's a hypothetical point, because I don't know what's gonna demographically happen in the future, but that Israel may have to choose between one of those two realities, and I don't want to see that happen. I don't think that they want to see that happen, but demographically speaking, it seems almost inevitable, and I don't know where this fits in the discussion, but I think it, it sort of also hamstrings us a little bit, not only in creating a peace solution, but also in the way we discuss it. So, yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I mean, very relevant question given what's happening with the with the, the nation state law that's being passed. How do you reconcile Israel's Jewish uh, identity with its democratic identity? Any thoughts? Yeah, I have thoughts on this. I, I think it's you're getting into obviously a really complicated situation. Um, some of this, by the way, goes back to, to something that I think someone like Alan might be concerned with with regard to BDS. One argument is that Israel's already chosen. Um, it is a it, it, it is chosen to be um, at least the self-definition its government um, as a Jewish state and is you know does rule possibly over a majority non-Jewish population already because of its military control over the West Bank and its control of his of Gaza's airspace population registry. Um, and, and even sort of who can go in and out of Gaza. So on the one hand, you could make an argument, and many do, many who support BDS make this argument that Israel has already chosen. Um, you know, I, I think that your broad question going to getting to this issue, um, I think that the, this has become a really key issue, and, and I'll go into something I teach, and my FSM students know this. I, I, I teach a lot on the American-Jewish relationship with Israel um, and generational differences when it comes to how older American Jews and younger American Jews, as Adam pointed out, bo all of whom um, in the non-Orthodox community, which is 85 to 90 percent of the U.S. population, are vastly majority liberal, vastly majority Democrat. That was the case in the 60s. It is the case today. Um, and so how, you know, again, linking this back to anti-Semitism, how can 
younger American Jews who may have different views on this than older American Jews, will, can they be accused of sort of taking a side? Can they be accused of anti-Semitism if they say Israel has made this choice, Israel is chosen to be a Jewish state as opposed to a democratic state? We, you know, we don't accept that. We want to criticize the state. So again, taking it back here, that is one, um, you know, one thing to think about. Um, I feel like I'm rambling now because I, I'm trying to sort of come up with one or two key points here. Um, so I will pass this. Um. Well, <clears throat> I don't get too bent out of shape about the notion of a Jewish state and a democratic state. I know there's a lot of ink spilled about this, a lot of uh, soul searching. I do think that the national uh, identity law is a big problem in Israel, and I think it's an yet another example of Israel's descent into an illiberal democracy. Um, but I, as far as being a Jewish state, I see no problem with it being majority Jewish, with having Jewish holidays, with having a Jewish character and Hebrew language. I mean, it has a star on the flag. Lots of countries have crosses on the flag. Lots of countries have Christmas off. I'm pretty sure America does. Um, DU acknowledges no religion, but we don't have school on Christmas. I'm pretty sure that that is indicative of a Christian character to American polity, and I think the same thing could be said for Israel. I do think you're right, however, that there is a right word and religious word drift uh, in Israeli politics that uh, foreshadows increasing illiberalism. Uh, but but just to go back to, to this issue of, of a Jewish state, and Adam talked about this in the context of the nation state law, and maybe what you were also talking about, and this is what I was getting to with control over the West Bank and Gaza, will there come a point where Israel um, it, you know, defines itself as a, um, defines its borders, which it has not done so al already, and defines its borders in such a way where Jews are the minority group? And, and, and what happens at that point? It's unlikely, actually, to shift because the birth rates of, of Palestinian Arabs have dropped and the birth rates of ultra-Orthodox Jews are over 7. The birth rates of Orthodox Jews are around 4.1 and, and secular Israelis are around Jews are around 2.1. So actually, the biggest demographic shift that you're likely to see in Israel's future within its 1949 borders is not the drift towards a majority Palestinian population. It's a drift towards a vastly minority secular Jewish Israeli population. Um, well, on that note, um, did you want do you want to end? Let me thank, um, first of all, the panelists for being here. Um, and let me thank the audience for your good questions. Thank you very much. And let me thank Gina and Zaid for putting this event together. We have another event coming up at the end of this uh, month on Yemen, U.S. foreign policy. See our website for more details. Thank you.